Hello and welcome. Hello, nice to see you all. I'm Kamal Kapadia. Welcome to this session on meaningful climate action. Uh, easy, simple topic that we're gonna cover perfectly in an hour. Just kidding. Um, uh, we're gonna give folks a couple of minutes to join and then we'll get started. We usually like to start these sessions with a bit of music, but I wasn't able to get that going this morning. Um, but hopefully all the other tech will work well. So thank you all for joining again. Welcome, I'm Kamal Kapadia, one of the founders of Terra.2. Um, and in the interest of time and to honor all of you who have joined well on time, I'm going to get started with this talk. Um, so I'm gonna share my screen. And all right, going to slideshow. Okay, so once again, I'm Kamal Kapadia, one of the founders at Terra.do, and I'm also the chief learning officer. And this is a session on meaningful climate action, what it looks like and how you can achieve it. So first I'm gonna start by telling you a little bit about myself and my own story. Uh, I'm just gonna request everyone to stay on mute if you can, uh, so we don't get any background sound or interference. And I would also request you to just uh, hold your questions till the end and then we'll take questions uh, uh, last 15 minutes. So this is a picture of me at the start of my career in the year 1999. My first job was with a solar energy company that did rural electrification in India, Sri Lanka, and Vietnam. So what we did was install solar panels and help to install solar home systems and help to finance them in off-grid communities in Asia, uh, these are people who did not have access to the grid. There are still 1 billion people in the world who lack access to the grid. And back then it was closer to 2 billion. And this is actually a solar panel that I installed with some of my colleagues. Um, and I even did all the wiring in this house, much to the horror of the people who lived there. Uh, um, and I start with this story because at that time, I really truly believed that we were going to fix this problem, climate change, through private sector action. So I was working in the private sector and I was a firm believer that if we just get companies pushing the right sorts of technologies forward, we can not only solve climate change, we can also help alleviate poverty. And I, I really was firmly convinced of this. I was in my early 20s. Um, at the same time, we kept running in the company, we kept running up against government and government policies because energy worldwide is a, you know, usually a regulated industry. There's a lot of government involvement. And there were many ways in which we were sort of coming up against government policies in ways that felt challenging. And I didn't fully understand this space. So I went off to graduate school and I decided to focus on policy. So I switched over to the world of policy. And on the left is an example of a report I helped to produce. It's one of the earliest studies on jobs and renewables. And in fact, this was actually a study that was commissioned by the John Kerry presidential campaign. This was uh, back in the early 2000s when he was running against George Bush Jr. He, of course, lost that election, but he did have a clean energy platform and he needed some numbers, especially around jobs. And so we did this study. Um, so I was I shifted over into policy. And on the right, uh, this is actually a, a picture from later stage in my career where I worked in clean energy advocacy in Hawaii. Uh, I lived in Hawaii for 10 years and uh, we were, I worked for an organization, Blue Planet Foundation, that uh, promoted clean energy policies and did a lot of advocacy and legislative action. And this is actually a picture of one of our, uh, at the end of one of the alleged sessions and we're standing, this is the entire team standing with the governor. And I'm also, I'm right there in this picture as well. This is the governor of Hawaii. This is some of the legislative wins we had. And so for a while I was really taken with policy and I thought, well, if we only push hard enough on policy everywhere around the world, if we just did enough on policy, we would be able to beat this thing called climate change. And of I'm course, my hard thinking hard. and my theories of change uh, around what we actually need continues to evolve and it sort of led me to where we are today, which is 
co-founding Terra.do. And again, this is just a request for folks to please uh, mute your microphones if you haven't done it already, so we don't get any background sound. Please put yourselves on mute. Thank you. Um, and I will have a chance to have a discussion at the end. So I have co-founded Terra.do uh, because my own theories of change have continued to evolve. And I have reached a point where I think it's not enough to just push on policy. Of course, policy is extremely important and we need to do as much as possible on policy, but it's not going to be enough. It's not enough to just push on private sector action. Obviously that is important, but it's not gonna be enough. We need everybody working on this problem. We need a grassroots movement. We need a hundred million people working on this problem in all walks of life, in all careers. Um, whether you work in government, whether you work in the private sector, whether you're in leadership, whether you're an employee, everybody needs to be working on this problem. And this is why I have come together with my co-founders to found Terra.do. Our uh, goal is to help, is to create this transition, essentially to accelerate this transition and enable people to solve this problem together. So, um, I'm going to get into the guts of the talk now, uh, but the first thing I want to do, actually, sorry, before I do that, I'm going to give you a little bit more about us. So just very quickly, how are we trying to do this? There are three types of programs we run and they all support each other. The first thing that we do is learning. Uh, we run a bunch of learning programs. This is just some examples of them. On the top left is our, what we call our climate boot camp uh, for career for professionals and especially for folks looking to transition their careers. Up on the top right is our Climate Farm School. This is an amazing hybrid program. It involves one week on a farm and then three weeks online around that. And then we have a program that's specifically for teams of employees in companies. So this is um, an offering for businesses and other organizations trying to upskill their employees to figure out climate action for their employees. So we do learning. The second important thing we do is career support and jobs. So we have a jobs board, a really big jobs board. We also run weekly jobs fairs where you can get right in front of recruiters. Um, and this also integrates into the learning programs that we run. And finally, we have an amazing, incredible community. We have now graduated several thousand people who've successfully transitioned their careers. We have 20 plus thousand people in our app, and I'll talk about that in a minute. And we really believe strongly in the importance of community. And I'll come back to this later in the talk, um, but our fellows, our learning fellows, that's what we call folks who graduate from our programs and are in our learning, learning programs. Uh, they are from all around the world. In every cohort of our Learning for Action program, we have people from 25 plus countries working in all kinds of organizations, big organizations that are listed here, but also small organizations, um, teachers, farmers, lawyers, you name it, they are all part of our community and it's a very supportive, helpful community. And all these three things come together in our app, learning, jobs, community. So if you've not, it's a free app, you can join. So if you haven't downloaded it already, please feel free to go to terra.do and just download the app. Um, now I'm gonna shift into the guts of the stock, meaningful climate action. But before I do that, I just wanna do a quick check-in on how you're feeling. So take a deep breath, close your eyes if you want to, and just check in and see how you're feeling right now. Um, and there's a purpose to this, and I will talk about that later in this talk, why we're doing this. And we'll be doing this a couple of times in this talk. But just check in with yourself and see if you're feeling relaxed like that little kitten or very anxious like this hamster. I show this uh, slide to my son and he didn't think the hamster looked anxious, but I think the hamster looks very anxious. Um, and sometimes it's helpful to just close your eyes um, because you'll find that you're actually storing stress in, in your body itself. Like maybe your stomach is clenched or your chest is tight or your throat is tight. Maybe you're clenching your jaws or your forehead is tight. Sometimes we store stress in our shoulders. And I'm just curious, put it in the chat, just put your number in the chat. And oh, I'm trying, I'm looking at the chat, there's already lots of numbers. Ooh, lots of stress, high levels of stress, but also some twos. Paying attention mode, I like that, right in the middle. Lots of fours, 
I'm seeing threes and fours. Yeah, a whole range of feeling emotions here. Yep. Anxious but excited about the possibilities. I like that. All right. Well, remember where you are at because we're going to be checking in a couple more times. So um, when we talk about meaningful climate action, I find this framework that's provided by All We Can Save to be very helpful. Now, All We Can Save is a movement and it's also this book. And if you're not familiar with it, I recommend checking it out. Uh, it's edited by Ayana Elizabeth Johnson and Catherine Wilkinson. Catherine Wilkinson is also on our academic advisory board. And this framework consists of three elements, truth, courage, and action. And so we're going to work through these three components and what they mean for us. Um, and we're going to start with truth. Um, so the first part of truth is just facing the reality that climate change is real and we are the cause. So uh, now I'm gonna work through some wonky graphs with you. Um, so what this graph, this graph is produced by a US uh, research agency. It's the fourth national climate assessment. And this graph is showing how temperatures have changed over time and what the drivers are. And so I'm gonna talk you through this graph on the, X-axis is just years from 1880 to 2020. The Y-axis shows a temperature difference from average and the average that they've taken is 1880 to 1910. So it's just how much temperatures, global average temperatures, these are global average temperatures, how much they've changed over time. And there's just three things I want you to focus on. First is this black line. So this black line is actually the observed temperatures that we see. So this is not model data, this is observed temperatures. Um, and you can see it's going up over time. The second thing to focus on is this blue line, which is the natural drivers. So the thing is there are natural processes going on all the time that affect temperatures. They're listed here, things like volcanic activity, changes in the solar energy reaching the earth, changes in our orbital pattern, which also affects the energy that reaches the earth. So these things do affect temperature. And if you actually model those effects, you can see that even though it does vary the temperatures, it's not on average increasing the temperatures. And the last thing to focus on here is the red line. So the red line are all the human drivers um, and that's greenhouse gases, ozone land cover. And you can see that the red line is tracking very closely to the observed changes. So the big takeaway from this graph, the main takeaway is that the temperature is, the, the global average temperature is increasing and we are the driver of this. And of course, the main driver is an increase in greenhouse gas concentrations, chiefly carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. So this is a graph produced by NOAA, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. It's a US government agency that does a lot of great research on climate science. And this graph, if you look at the x-axis, it goes back in time 800,000 years. So this is from an ice core. Um, this is ice core data from Antarctica. And we can actually now go back in time 800,000 years and see what has been going on with carbon dioxide concentrations in the atmosphere. And you can see carbon dioxide concentrations have varied over time. Um, and of course, the scary part is the last part of this graph. When you look at it on such a big time scale, it's incredibly dramatic what's going on. The black part of this line is just represents where the industrial revolution started. So you can see how much we have increased carbon dioxide concentrations in the atmosphere. We are around 417 parts per million right now. And um, carbon dioxide, of course, is a greenhouse gas. It traps heat close to the earth. and so the first graph showed us that the temperatures are going up. The second graph shows us that carbon dioxide concentrations have dramatically increased. This is the chief driver of climate change. Um, and of course, where is that carbon dioxide coming from? It's coming from burning fossil fuels and land use change. Land use changes are things like deforestation and agriculture specifically, especially uh, raising cattle for beef production, but also other ways in which we're changing um, the land land cover, and you can see what's going on with CO2 emissions. We keep burning fossil fuels and we keep 
emitting more carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. So climate change is real and climate change, and we are the drivers burning fossil fuels and chief, chiefly burning fossil fuels and land use change. Um, of course, also, it's not climate change is not something that's going to happen in the future. It's here and now. Uh, this quite uh, the dramatic visual is produced by the UK Met Office Hadley Center. This is a UK government's sort of chief climate science research agency. It's a very compelling graphic. What they've done is for every single year, they have looked at how the average temperature in every month um, uh, varies compared to the average uh, for, for this earlier period in time. And you can see that as we go through the years, we're just getting warmer and warmer and warmer. And uh, this last decade, especially, it has the seven warmest years on record. June 2022 was the warmest June on record. We are continuously warming the earth. Um, and of course, these global average temperatures, they translate into actual impacts in different places. We don't have time to get into the details of how global average temperatures affect weather in different places. We do cover this in some detail in our course, how scientists can actually measure the fingerprint of climate change on specific events such as um, that cause natural disasters. This is just a graph that shows uh, US billion dollar disasters, uh, billion dollar plus disasters. They are increasing over time. Of course, disasters aren't only caused by climate change, but you can find climate change fingerprint quite clearly on most of these events. Um, so uh, climate change is real, it's happening now. We are the cause. Uh, and what the scientists are telling us is that we should not exceed 1.5 degrees Celsius of average global warming. This is a threshold that is generally agreed to be the threshold we should not cross. Of course, there's scientists who think this is already also just too high already, but this is sort of generally a number that we should not be crossing. This wonky graphic is from an IPCC report. The IPCC is the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. Uh, this is a UN agency that produces the best, one can sort of think of it as producing the best of climate science. And the way they do it is they synthesize the findings of thousands of climate scientists from around the world into these reports that are called assessment reports. Um, so what this graphic basically shows is that uh, it shows how the risks of various things we care about increase as we increase global average temperatures. Um, and so as you get into this purple zone, and you can see here, it says purple indicates very high risks of severe impacts and presence of significant irreversibility or the persistence of climate related hazards combined with limited ad ability to adapt due to the nature of the hazard. And so they've taken these things called reasons for concern, <clears throat> for example, extreme weather events. And you can see that as you cross 1.5 C, you're getting into more and more dangerous zones. Um, and if you zoom into some of these impacts on things that we care about, everything from corals to coastal flooding to crop yields, you can see that as we cross 1.5 C, we are getting into dangerous impacts. And um, they are uh, uh, possibly irreversible changes. Uh, <clears throat> the unfortunate news is that we are actually currently well on track to cross 1.5 C. In fact, we will probably do so in the next 10 years or so and are heading toward two to three degrees Celsius of warming. Sorry, one more wonky graph and then we will stop with the wonky graph soon, I promise. Um, <clears throat> so this graphic, um, I'll talk you through it. What this graphic shows is where we're headed for in terms of temperatures. On the x-axis is time. On the y-axis is emissions per year. And I'm going to just tell you what to focus on. So the black line shows historically uh, where, where, what we're doing. So these are our emissions every year over time. That little V there is COVID. So we went down for a little while, but we, we bumped straight back up. Um, and 
this so there's a few things that i want you to focus on so this blue cone now this is all projections into the future this is produced by climate action tracker which is a great resource and website um, that's kind of tracking all countries progress towards climate goals um, against sort of scientifically determined targets so the blue area this blue cone is actually currently where we're headed with if you add up all the policies and actions that countries are taking today if you add up all the policies and actions and you project out into the future, this is where we're headed. Um, <clears throat> the other thing I want you to focus on is this light blue line. This light blue line says, it says, um, it says pledges and targets. So these are pledges and promises that countries have made. And if we were actually on track with those, we would actually be heading towards 2C. But the reality is right now, every single country is not on track with its pledges. It is off track. So this is a more accurate measurement of where we're headed. This is if we were actually fulfilling the pledges and targets, um, we, would, we would be on this track. Um, and of course, the green line is where we need to be to be 1.5C compatible. So every year we need to be dramatically reducing our emissions. We need to be dramatically reducing our emissions. Um, we need to reduce them by about 50% uh, in the next age, by 2030, and then completely eliminate them by 2050 or so. This, allow, this one is actually showing us um, down to like kind of eliminating them by 2080, but in this time range, we need to eliminate all emissions. Um, and of course, all of these things have very dramatic impacts uh, and we're not gonna talk about all of them, but one thing that I think doesn't get enough attention is how it's going to shape human migration. There is this amazing investigative series of stories um, pro co-produced by ProPublica and the New York Times called The Great Climate Migration. I strongly recommend you Google this and look it up if you're interested in this topic. They are all freely accessible. There's no paywall. Uh, and it's quite amazing what is already going on because of climate change in terms of human migration. One of the things the studies, the, the articles say is that right now, 1% of the Earth's land is uh, essentially an unlivable hot zone. And by 2070, even just on current trajectory that we're on, we're expecting 19% to be an unlivable hot zone. These kinds of changes um, make it impossible for people to grow food in many parts of the world, um, and they are going to pick up and start moving, and we're already seeing that. So, all right, we're going to pause there and do another check-in. Um, and let's take another deep breath. Oh, and I see a lot of fives. <laughs> It's also okay if you're feeling disassociated, you're feeling numb, you're feeling bored, you can put those words in. Um, it's quite common to feel disassociated or kind of, yeah, um, you know, disconnected. And again, I'm going to talk about the purpose of these check-ins in a little bit. So just bear with me. So um, yes, so disengage, this is a very common reaction. Um, and in fact, there's a uh, research in psychology and communication studies that says that if you present people with a bunch of like really scary, bad information and you don't give them a way to resolve it, the feeling, the overwhelming emotion is going to be disassociation. So um, totally normal reaction. Uh, and so we're gonna move on from this, um, but thank you for sharing. All right, so now let's talk about solutions. Okay, part two, solutions. Because that is also part of the truth, all right? Solutions are also part of the truth. So the first big message, sorry, another wonky graph. I like wonky graphs. Um, there is no substitute for rapid emission reductions, okay? We have to reduce our emissions to zero or net zero to stop global warming. As long as we are emitting any amount of CO2, we will continue warming because CO2 is a long lived gas in the atmosphere. So even if we reduce our rate of emissions, even if we're emitting less next year than we are this year, we are still adding to temperatures. 
until we get to zero or net zero emissions, temperatures will continue to increase. By net zero, we mean eliminate, stop most emissions, and then remove some. There is no getting out of this. It is the nature of carbon dioxide. It is a long lived gas. And when we get to zero or net zero, we will stabilize at that temperature, unless we can continue to draw, draw carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. So there is no getting around this. We have to get to zero or net zero emissions. And that essentially means stopping burning all fossil fuels and changing some land use practices. Of course, we know how to do this. There are a whole set of measures that are really well established. And I've been in this space for a long time. And I'll say that, you know, say even 10 or 15 years ago, we were not sure in certain sectors what the answers are going to be. For example, with uh, passenger vehicles, we didn't know, is it going to be hydrogen? Is it going to be biofuels? Is it going to be electric? A lot of that has been resolved just with like te technology advances and um, you know advances in battery technology, et cetera. A lot of the measures are just well established now. We know what we need to be doing. This is a great little summary table produced by WRI, the World Resources Institute, on a whole set of measures, all the measures, basically the important ones that we need to be pursuing. And they are tracking how well we're doing on all these measures um, towards 2030 targets, which is basically reducing our emissions by 50% compared to, compared to today, actually compared to 2020. And you can see that essentially we're not on track for any of the measures, but there's a bunch of measures which are heading in the right direction at a promising but insufficient pace. So for example, if you focus in on this one, which says share of zero carbon sources in electricity generation, this is just how fast we're adding renewable energy to the grid. They're saying, well, we are adding a lot of renewables to the grid fast, but we need to be doing it six X faster, six times faster. Um, then there's a whole bunch of measures. The change is heading in the right direction, but well before below the required pace, things like stopping deforestation, um, green hydrogen production, a whole bunch of climate finance, and then of course, there's things that are headed in the wrong direction. For example, we are continuing to build fossil fuel plants in parts of the world um, and uh, you know, for electricity generation. So that needs a complete U-turn. So this is just a nice little graphic that captures all the measures and you know, where we're at with them. Um, now I'm gonna step out on a limb here. Uh, and this, by the way, I would say at this point, we're not in truth, but more in opinion. And I think 1.5C by 2100 is still achievable. Uh, and I would say, I, I, I say this because I see three virtuous cycles that mutually support each other. One of the first one is with technology, uh, clean tech and market innovations have made technologies like solar PV the cheapest source of electricity ever. ever. Solar energy is the cheapest source of electricity everywhere in the world. And if you remember, I started my career way back in the 90s uh, in solar. It was the most, it was so ex extravagantly expensive. Um, it was a very, very expensive technology. And the, the rate at which costs have come down have exceeded everybody's predictions. Even the you know, well-known pundits have all been under predicting, uh, dramatically under predicting the rate at which these technologies are going to take off and have taken off and the, way, the rate at which their costs have come down. And we're seeing new battery technologies all the time as well. Uh, a lot of good stuff happening on technology. Finance, so of course finance could be doing a lot more, but we are seeing some major shifts um, in just in the three years that we uh, have been running our learning courses. And I personally update all the content in our learning for action class, essentially every quarter. And one of the things I've noticed changing the fastest is finance. Like when I have to do update the finance classes, uh, it's just dramatic, like how much is shifting. Huge financial companies like BlackRock are taking significant steps. BlackRock is the world's largest asset manager. They have like $10 trillion under management. And then of course we've got policy. Um, as of November, 2022, 140 countries have announced or are considering net zero targets covering close to 90% of global emissions. One can argue how serious these targets are, whether we're on track, whether the policies have teeth or not, but this is a dramatic change even just in five years. Um, 
The only thing that I think we're doing poorly on is justice. Um, we don't have time to dig into this. Uh, I think this is a very important, exceptionally important topic. And in our Learning for Action program, it's uh, we, draw, we draw this justice lens throughout the course. But this is one thing we need to be doing a lot better on. So back to our framework. Um, and now it's time to focus on the second part of this framework. And I'm going to combine courage and action into uh, together and talk about them together. So um, let's, so all of this stuff can feel a little bit abstract. So let's try to make it concrete in terms of what you can do. Now, the first thing is you probably heard this every job is a climate job. Uh, I'm only going to say a couple of small things on this because we have a whole other talk coming up by my colleague, Seth Collins, on precisely this topic on career transitions and skills uh, that are needed in the sector. Um, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this. But the one thing I'll say is having now graduated a few thousand people and watch them transition into climate jobs from entirely outside, I can say with great certainty that we really do need every skill. Like we see jobs for pretty much all your skills. If you are a professional working in just about anything, you can apply yourself to solving this problem. Of course, in order to do that, uh, you need three things, or we collectively need three things. And this is actually the foundations of all our programs as well. And we have arrived at this by helping people over and over and over achieve this transition. And we've arrived at this, you know, three pillars of sustainable transformation through direct experience of doing this work over and over and over. And these three pillars are knowledge acquisition and skills development. So yes, even if you have your own professional skills, you still need to figure out how it applies to climate and you might need to build some new skills. You need to acquire some knowledge. So that's part, that's just one thing. The other really important thing is emotional resilience. And this is why I've been doing these tiny little check-ins. They're just a little teaser of much deeper work that we do at Terra with our own community. Um, this is so critically important because climate change is very anxiety provoking. Career transitions are anxiety provoking. There's a lot of other stuff going on in this world in your life that's anxiety provoking. And it's easy to disassociate um, and feel like you can't you can't keep doing this work if you are not also working on this. So this is as important as knowledge acquisition and skills development and is not given enough attention. But we do focus on this in our learning programs. This is another part of this pillar. Oh, sorry, this is the other yeah the other pillar. And the third thing is community because this is very hard to do alone you will struggle to achieve this on your own. You need a community that is supportive, that is helpful, that is bringing you along, that you can share your experience with, that you can provide support to, that you can provide help to. You need a community. And all these three, three things are mutually supportive. And when you've got these three pillars in place, you will be successful in transitioning over and getting and doing the work that's needed. Um, so back to the wonky graph, sorry, um, you've already seen this, uh, but the reason I bring this up again is because even those three pillars aren't quite enough. And there's one little missing component, a big missing component that I wanna talk about using the same graph. graph. So you see this line, historical emissions, the thing I didn't show you last time is about 15 years ago, this is the trajectory we were on. So 15 years ago, all the science and all the projections were telling us that we were actually heading towards four to five de degrees C of warming, catastrophic warming. Um, and we have bent the curve already. We, have, we are now on this blue traje trajectory. And the missing component is courage. We bent this curve because people working in government, people working in the private sector, people in their communities, activists, et cetera, they went outside their comfort zone and they pushed and got some things changed. 
So this is the key missing component, courage. And of course, what we need is, sorry, a whole lot more courage. So we need every single one of you to be courageous. And what courage involves is stepping outside your comfort zone and doing something new. Um, even if you already work in climate, you still have to push, push a little bit further, use your imagination and step up and be courageous. Um, so uh, one last check-in on how folks are feeling. Seeing some threes and fours, which is much better than the fives. Oh, I got a one, that's awesome. Some twos, 3.333, I like that. Still at four, yes, I hear you, I feel you. Lots of uh, lower numbers though than at the start of the stock. Optimistic, I like that. Awesome, good to see these numbers. All right, so I'm going to end with a prompt. Um, and actually it's a visioning exercise. And I want you to think about this. The year is 2045 and we have solved this problem. We have successfully solved climate change. And you are one of the many heroes of this great transition. And your story was inspiring to mil millions. At this point, Terra.do is a huge platform with millions of people and you've been invited back to share your story. So what one courageous act will, can you think of one courageous act that will be part of your story? What courageous act are you going to engage in? And remember this involves going beyond your comfort zone, facing one difficult truth about yourself, your organization, your sector, your anything you want. This is not something you've done before, but it's something you will do. And use your imagination. Think of courageous people you admire and their stories um, and be inspired by them. So thank you very much. Um, I want to put a little plug for our courses, um, especially the Learning for Action course. We start a new cohort every six weeks. We're hosting a bunch of open houses. Uh, if you're in the app, you'll just see announcements for them. Uh, you'll get emails as well. Um, I believe we also have a discount code you can use if you're participating. Um, I'll ask Ian, uh, my colleague, to just share it in the chat. Um, Ian, if you could just share in the chat what the discount code is. Climate Week 20, Climate Week 20. You can just use that discount code for 20% off. Um, and yeah, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen. And this is a really large group. So I'm going to ask that you put your questions in the chat and then I'll just try to, I've got, we've got 20 minutes and I'll try to answer, answer them as best as I can. And thank you very much for being here. Thank you for your kind words as well. So I guess nobody, Nobody has any questions. I guess we saw this. We know what meaningful climate action is. <laughs> Will there be a recording? Um, Ian, do you know if we are recording? And yeah, we are recording. I can see that. So I'm sure we'll be we'll be sharing this. Kamal, I'll ask um, the question if that's okay. Um, actually, I'm going to ask people to put it in the chat just because there's so many of us on this call. There's 311 people. So I. I'm sorry, but I think it's best. I'm just going to start with the ones that are right on top here. There's a lot of, as I was sciencing our way. Um, yes. So this is a really important question. And in fact, we didn't have time to get into this, but it actually is a fundamental question of the mental models that we use to approach this problem, okay? Because whether we're aware, aware of this or not, we come at this with different mental models. And so I'm gonna read out this question, sorry. There's a lot of excitement about sciencing our way out of the climate problem with new technology and some elbow grease, but it's like building highway expansions. At first there's more room for the cars and more cars show up um, to use the available lanes and traffic gets even worse. So how do we effectively convince the developed world to just consume less voluntarily? 
I would prefer voluntary if guided behavioral change to compulsion by force. So there is a fundamental question as to about whether we can solve this problem um, kind of still while still growing our economies and continuing to consume. And there's two different mental models here. One mental model that says, well, yes, we can do this. And there's another and a bunch of analysis to support that. And there's another mental model that says, there's just no way we can do this. And there's a lot of analysis to support that. Um, and it's like a big, deep, thorny thing. And we do actually get into this. We have a whole class called mental models in our learning for action program. Um, and these are just these are just two, two sides of one type of mental. There's other parts of this mental models question which is just like your fundamental assumptions and frameworks for approaching this problem. Um, and more, you are all, every, all of us are operating with these mental models. It's just a question of whether you're conscious of them or not. So um, I can't answer this question exactly because first of all, I'm not convinced that people are gonna cons consume less voluntarily. Like I see no signs of this. Like, in fact, I just saw this amazing study yesterday it just really kind of blew my mind. And it was about energy efficiency. And the study was based in the UK. And what they found was that when you insulate homes, when you actually insulate homes, the energy use doesn't go down. In fact, it goes up. And if you think about this and you get a little bit deeper into it, it's actually because, well, especially for poor people, when their homes are poorly insulated, they just kind of you know, turn off the heat and live in the cold. But once they actually have insulation and it's going to cost them less, they're actually going to eat their, heat their homes to a comfort, a level of comfort. And in fact, even rich people increase their energy consumption once they've got the insulation. Uh, it was just kind of blew my mind. Like it was very interesting study. Uh, and um, so I don't know that one can do this voluntarily. Uh, at least I haven't seen signs of this working. Um, the, there's a few things that can shift consumption. And one is of course like policies that just make certain things a lot more expensive. Uh, uh, single use plastic, like, you know, like please can we just get rid of single use plastic? Certain things we might be able to do if we just have the, some combination of policy and good technology and, you know, all those things in place, finance, et cetera. Um, other things, I'm not sure uh, if we're going to consume less. Sometimes you have to think about this problem in a different way. So, for example, one of the biggest drivers in agriculture of greenhouse gases is, uh, you know, growing cattle to have meat and meat consumption globally is going up. But of course, there's all this interest and growth in plant based meats and other types of meat. and if this kind of takes off, it could dramatically take reduce the impact on land. Like we could be using a lot less land for agriculture because uh, it's actually one of the biggest drivers of deforestation, especially tropical deforestation is expansion of land, say in the Amazon, expansion of land uh, for ranching, for growing cattle. So, um, sorry, that was a very waffly answer. Didn't have a good answer for you but I think this is a really good question and it gets at a really important, uh, deeper philosophical question as to how we approach this problem. All right. Ooh, what is your courageous act in 2045? Well, this is a great question. Um, <laughs> so I don't want to think out of 2045. It's like, what is my courageous act this year? <laughs> And uh, one of them, I mean, it's a great question. Uh, so there are some changes I want to bring about to my personal life that I've not been super successful at doing. Uh, you know, for a long time, I was vegetarian, then I fell off. I don't eat red meat, but I fell off being vegetarian. I want to get back on. I don't know if that's courageous or not. Um, I definitely have a lot of very ambitious plans for Terra. So I think I will be certainly pushing a lot and, you know, taking some, uh, as founders, one of your hardest choices is deciding where to really, like where to run experiments, like what, what new experiments do you want to run? What feels like the right experiment to run now and what evidence do you see? So 
just kind of i you know want to exercise good wisdom and make some of these choices correctly um so yeah i think if i'm taking any courageous acts it's definitely in the context of my work uh, and a few changes in my personal life um can you speak on justice ooh my favorite topic justice <laughs> this is my favorite topic uh um so again i actually have a whole talk on this like climate justice like why you should care about climate justice even if you work in the private sector and what you can do about it uh so first of all what do we mean when we say justice it's a complex word it's a loaded word it means different things to different people if you can like you know the simplest version of this is uh climate change is going to impact different people differently and people who are already on the margins of vulnerable or poor are likely to suffer the worst impacts when they have not contributed to the problem in the first place now this plays out domestically in countries but it also plays out especially plays out internationally so the latest you know every year all these governments get together in this government representatives get together in this thing called cop conference of parties which is this ongoing un negotiations around global climate action and what every country is committing to in terms of targets etc and one of the most like the biggest most contentious things is uh, actually centered around justice which is what do northern countries or developing countries how much money needs to flow from north to south in order to deal with some of these justice things big and complicated so you, there's a global story to justice there's there's like local domestic stories to justice who's who's getting impacted how are we dealing with them how are we helping them there's another whole side to this which is transitioning away, away from fossil fuels affects fossil fuel workers so there's a whole story around justice in the energy transition and energy justice and how are we dealing with the fact that a lot of people are going to be unemployed as we shift these shift our whole energy system to clean energy so what's going on there the you know uh, one of the interesting things is a, a lot of places that have been traditionally heavy in fossil have had a lot of fossil fuel industry are not the places necessarily where we're seeing the solar and wind industries take off and so there's a whole like geographical question there the one place where that does not apply by the way is the state of texas fastest growth in renewables major fossil fuel state it's the state in the us where fossil the renewables are going the fastest um so um there's that dimension of justice um so there's the aspect of how climate change is going to impact people differently and what we're doing about it globally and domestically and then there's the whole aspect of as we to undertake climate action how do we not leave people behind um so as we undertake climate action how do we make sure we are not perpetuating existing injustices worsening them um and compensating people and doing the right thing uh so sorry very brief answer it's a complex topic i appreciate the question okay how to deal with fast growing countries so this is a very good question uh one thing i'll say about china is no country is putting in renewable energy faster than china like last year china installed as much renewable energy as india's entire electricity generating capacity all right so literally and a lot of the reasons why we have very cheap solar panels is because the chinese government in various ways is subsidizing manufacture of solar which upsets the us and that's why they're trying to get domestic solar panels. but it also means we have very cheap solar panels so china and also like the amount of stuff china is doing on evs uh, you know electric trains like it's nuts like what's going on in that country we don't have a lot of visibility in it but they are transitioning really fast now the one important thing that's buried in this question is the fact that even as they are accelerating so we just focus on energy for instance even as they are accelerating renewables their energy demand is growing so fast that the rate of growth of renewables is not enough and so they are also putting in some fossil fuel and so but you know like it's i think it's just a matter of like literally just i think in this decade we're going to be 
the one thing that I feel most positive about is the transition to clean energy. Like the one thing where I see just so much momentum and especially now in the US with the IRA, this new federal policy, the very cleverly named Inflation Reduction Act, which is really just climate policy. Um, it is like an incredible omnibus of a bill. And like, it's going, it's made renewables so ridiculously cheap. Like somebody who I, who works in the sector told me like the federal government is effectively paying like 60% of the cost of solar installations now. Uh, other things like green hydrogen, like it's, it's going to make the US green hydrogen industry like dominate the world. This is why the EU is like up in arms about what's going on because the, the amount of money that's going to flow into clean energy, into buildings, um, into electric vehicles. Uh, not not to say that there aren't major challenges, like there's a lot of stuff that's like challenging about this transition, but in this country, which is the biggest country, I mean, one by certain measures, the largest contributor to climate change globally, uh, there's finally a lot of money and action, and we're gonna see this playing out over the next 10 years. Um, so, it's a great question about India and China. Uh, they are very fast growing economies. The energy demand is going up. China, not as much as India. India's energy demand is going up significantly. The one thing that I've noticed going on in India too is the big traditional energy companies are sh shifting focus. There's a massive shift towards renewables. Like it's just become good business. Like it's just a no brainer now to be doing solar, wind, batteries, EVs, et cetera. It's just good business, which was not the case when I started in this sector. This was not the case at all 20 years ago. Like it was not good business. It was kind of insanity to be in this sector. Like you had to be a little bit crazy to be like starting a solar business or a wind business back then. Um, and you really needed the subsidies. And now these technologies are just dramatically cheap on their own. And again, this is not to minimize the challenges of how you transition a whole energy system, but to say that it's the one place where I feel things are continuing to accelerate at a dramatic pace, like enough where we might actually get there, we might actually achieve this. Um, do you think that countries that do not implement the NDC should be penalized or what can be done? Okay, this is a brilliant question. NDCs are uh, basically what countries are committing to in these global negotiations, these conference of parties. Um, it's their nationally determined contribution. So it's just like their, what they say they're gonna do, okay? Now, it's impossible, I think, globally. You'll struggle to penalize globally. I, I don't know how this is gonna come about. One way in which this is sort of going to come about, and we're seeing a few signs of this, is actually around trade. So. Trade is gonna get very tricky when one country is now saying, we are going to require that all steel that comes into this country is low carbon steel. Or so there's stuff, and also when certain countries are heavily gonna subsidize certain industries, new, new industries. So trade is gonna get tricky. Um, not totally clear how we're gonna deal with this. We're already seeing the EU getting a bit upset about this US IRA, because they think it's anti-competitive for their own industries. So that might be one way in which we're sort of kind of going to penalize countries. Hard to know how it's gonna play out. The most effective thing is strong domestic policy, right? So like essentially when a country makes a commitment, those penalties should be internal domestic policy effectively. So now there's a very high cost for not doing this. So for example, when I was working in Hawaii, this was the first state in the US to pass a 100% clean electricity law in 20. Uh, so by 2045, the entire grid had to be clean. And by the way, this is quite tricky for a state like Hawaii because you have a bunch of small islands, you can have like cloud cover that covers your entire island for like a week. So um, when you're dealing with solar sources, for example, how do you run your grid? Uh, there's no cables between the islands. You can't pass electricity back and forth. So um, the that law, when it passed, it had real teeth. There were real penalties for the utility, severe penalties for not doing this work and not getting on board. Now, this is not to say the utility made it easy. It's been like a huge struggle to actually 
get the utility on track, but your laws need real penalties built in domestically. And that's your best bet uh, because really like the UN doesn't really have like power to dictate policy or tell your governments what to do. Or no government is going to give up its sovereignty this way to another country. Um, so your best bet is dom strong domestic policies that have, you know, penalties built, built in. Uh, sustainable finance. Yes. What is your what is the role of sustainable finance in your opinion in the solutions area? So um, you know, finance is a very, very important lever, a very powerful player. And we're seeing, like I put, I had that one slide and we said, we're seeing some really good things, but we're also seeing some bad things, right? We're just seeing like all these ESG metrics. There's a lot of questions around whether they are meaningful. It turned out that like a lot of these ESG metrics, this is environmental and social governance, these metrics that are now used for like investment decisions. Um, when companies were saying that they were like doing the right thing, all they were doing was measuring the impact of climate change on their organization. Like they were not actually looking at how they were contributing to the problem. So there was like lots of questions around these metrics. There's no single way in which we're doing a good job measuring progress in finance. Um, that said, we are seeing some interesting things happening, certainly around public finance. So um, there's some new funds. So through these UN mechanisms, we're seeing some big funds uh, being set up for tra transferring money from global north to global south. Uh, and then the other thing that's happening is, I mean, it's interesting to watch a company like BlackRock which is the world's largest asset manager. And what that means is say the California pension fund, like the state pension fund, which is huge, will hand their money to BlackRock to invest. Um, like essentially BlackRock, like they are, their like, amount of money they manage is just huge. Um, they are doing a lot. Uh, they have this thing called the um, Aladdin. So they've got this platform called Aladdin, which is a risk assessment tool for companies who they work with. And they've created this whole other platform called Climate Aladdin. And in fact, the their chief scientist, uh, he I I I know this guy, and he's like a amazing climate scientist. The models that he uses are extremely rigorous. Um, they are really trying to build the tools that the financial industry needs. And of course, BlackRock has a bad reputation in the world in other ways, and people are critical of this company, but they have a lot of power and influence and they are sort of taking some interesting steps. So again, if you work in finance, there's a lot you could be doing. There's a, a lot that banks could be doing. Banks, plenty of big US banks, just head in the sand continuing to invest in fossil fuels, um, you know, not on the right track at all. There are some interesting European banks, especially cooperative banks in France that are com have completely divested. They're divesting entirely from fossil fuels, no new fossil fuels, no existing fossil fuels, et cetera. So you see a lot of differences. So yeah, uh, super powerful lever though, because if you can direct the money in the right direction, you can achieve a lot. Um, oh, so the one thing that I think is gonna happen with finance, by the way, in the US is that IRA is going to be a big support. Like it's going to just like, uh, it's going to provide a very clear like policy environment for finance to private finance to back jump on as well. So now that you know that green hydrogen is like, clearly going to be profitable because look at these IRA subsidies for the next 10 years, you're probably going to invest in green hydrogen because the government is like making it a good deal for you essentially. And the way the policies are written, the way the law is written, it's going to be virt it's virtually impossible to like, so say tomorrow, like Trump got elected again, God forbid, um, and we return to the Republican administration, it's going to be kind of impossible to undo these laws. I mean, nothing is impossible by the way right now, like 
in this country, but so I can't say definitely, but they've, ri they've written it in a very clever way. Um, and it's going to be extremely hard. Basically, nobody can take away subsidies once they put them in. It's just not politically. And though I saw this other super interesting thing that most of this IRA investment is actually going into red states. There's more IRA money that's going to flow into red states than blue states. So that's another really interesting development out of this policy. Okay, so we are actually at time. If you need to drop, please feel free to drop. I'm happy to continue looking at these questions. If you want to stay on, I'm happy to stay for another 15 minutes. There's a lot of questions in the chat. Um, so I will keep answering them. And But please, thank you so much for joining. Please check out our learning, learning programs and our jobs um, and our app. And yeah, please feel free to drop if you need to. Um, so let's look at the next question. Oh yes, there was a dip during COVID. Yes. In fact, we have a assignment question on this, which is to actually calculate what that dip is. Um, we uh, Okay, so COVID, right? Everyone stopped going places. Like they grounded all the flights. We were all stuck at home. So we stopped, we were maybe consuming a little more electricity in our homes, but we stopped flying, which is a big source of use of energy. We stopped um, traveling for two years. And so we do see a dip in what happens with emissions correspondingly, because we stopped using as much energy, but it is a very tiny dip. It's not as big as you might expect. It's just this little, and then it immediately goes back up. Like 2021, we start seeing it beginning to turn and we're just heading up again. <laughs> so yeah, COVID, there was this little dip uh, in emissions for a couple of years. <clears throat> and that's because we just, was staying at home. Most of us had to stay at home. Um, lowest hanging fruits. What do you think are the lowest hanging fruits to tackle policy and or technology? So um, let's talk about policy. Um, at this point, it seems having policies so the one interesting thing with policy and especially energy policy is that states have a lot of power in many parts of the world energy is not regulated by the central government it's regulated by states um, cities can have a lot of power cities actually in the u.s cities are doing an incredible amount of stuff um, they have a lot of purchasing power right cities can make big decisions so um, for a lot of people. So when you say policy, just keep in mind, you can achieve policy at different scales. Uh, the other thing is the, um, it's a great question, lowest hanging fruit on policy. One, one area where I think policy really needs to be doing more is actually removing barriers to accelerating renewables right now. So for example, right now in the US, there's a massive problem of this thing they call the interconnection queue. So because we haven't invested in transmission capacity for like decades, essentially, uh, you've got like all these solar projects that are ready to connect to the grid, but they are just waiting. They're waiting for the regulators. So we've got this huge massive backlog of solar and wind projects in these interconnection queues. and um, there's this agency in the U.S. called FERC, the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission. Um, they're trying to solve this problem. But this problem is solved at the regulatory level. Like, you don't even need, like, you know, elected representatives. It would help if elected representatives pass policies. And in fact, I believe there is some stuff that did pass in the subsequent bill, the one after the IRA. But there's a lot that we should be doing to... Uh, remove the barriers. Uh, for example, in India, there we have a problem where uh, the utilities are financially insolvent, essentially, like they are not doing very well. And so there is this problem of like, well, are they, um, like if a solar project is selling to a utility, like are they, can they reliably pay? So therefore the risk of the projects goes up. So you might have policies that, basically compensate for the risk like 
So for example, World Bank could step in with some kind of like loan guarantee program or some kind of programs that just make the financials look better for say solar projects. So de depending on where you are and the context, I think policies that would remove barriers to renewable, that's one really important thing. The second thing is justice and redistribution and making sure that people are not getting left behind and are not getting um, unfairly impacted. So um, that is critical policy, really, very important. Um, a lot of this could be adaptation work. So sorry, we didn't cover adaptation at all in this talk, but what are governments doing around adaptation? Adaptation is not a space where a lot of private sector activity, you're seeing a lot of private sector activity. This is fundamentally government, nonprofit, aid agencies. So we need a lot of work in adaptation. Um, just coming back to energy and transport, like things like things that make it really easy to put in charging infrastructure, EV charging infrastructure around the country. Um, there's weird places where policy shows up. So for example, in Hawaii, um, just changing the building codes and requirements for new construction. And this is often done at the city and county level, building codes. So for example, we were, when I was in working in clean energy advocacy, we were trying to get the codes changed so that any new build, like new, like multi-story buildings were EV ready. Because actually um, to go into a parking lot of a building and putting the EV charging stations after the fact is phenomenally expensive. But if you actually, when you're building the buildings, if you just have all the right wires and stuff in place so that the building is EV ready, and this is a building code requirement. Um, so you can achieve things through building codes, dramatic things, by the way, through building codes, which is city and county level, at least in the US. Um, so sorry, this is just a few things. It's a good question. Um, I'm sure there's more systematic ways of thinking about it, but these are just the things that are on top of my mind. Um, okay. Um, uh, I see, Bess, you have a follow-up question, but I'll come back to you. Uh, what do you think are the lowest hanging fruits to tackle? Oh, policy and technology. Oh, technology, what's really interesting is what's happening around battery technologies. So, it's quite amazing, honestly, like the advances in battery technologies and especially these new, um, I think they're called iron air batteries, uh, which I just read are like 10 times cheaper than lithium ion batteries. And unlike lithium, which is, you know, um, not as abundant a material, uh, there's a company called Form Energy that just raised like a huge ton of money to be built and they're going to be building out manufacturing. So there's some good stuff to be watching on storage technologies. And I think that is evolving really, really fast. Um, the other things where we need a lot of work are uh, say aviation. Like we don't have a good solution for aviation right now. There's various experiments being run with hydrogen and for short hauls, you maybe have some battery technology but we need to do work on aviation. The biggest, the place which is the hardest, they call this hard to decarbonize sectors and that's industry. So chemicals, um, iron and steel, cement, uh, these are the big ones, petrochemicals, uh, pet, you know, petrochemicals, those are big ones. And all of them have solutions, but they're not perfect solutions. They can be expensive. So that's where you need, a, you really need policy and you really need the technological innovations. And this, um, so, you know, Gates has this, um, Bill Gates has this investment company called Breakthrough Energy Ventures. And if you just look at their website, they are investing in, in a lot of these like kind of hard tech startups, like they are focused on hard tech. So if you want to have a look at like, hey, what are the cutting edge technologies and what's going on? Like that's a good starting point, their website, because they talk, they have a lot of information on their site. Um, what is the role of faith communities? This is a great question. I mean, extremely powerful and some of like, some, you know, at least in the US, like, so much racial justice activism like came through faith communities and churches and like churches were you know the place where so much of this organizing took place it's a place of strong community uh you see a lot of 
at least churches definitely embracing this as part of their mission. Uh, it's a good question, like in other faiths, like how is this? Like there's certainly, I know in amongst the Buddhists, uh, there's some interest and um, a lot of the emotional resilience work that we draw on can, draws on certain Buddhist practices, which are also basically now just mainstream psychological practices. So also just offering offering the tools for building emotional resilience, for dealing with the crisis, uh, <clears throat> for accepting what's going on, very important. Uh, and also for just motivating action, for providing places for people to come together, think about how they can work together. Um, and I believe this is happening. I don't know enough about it, but I've I've seen it in a few places at least. How are we reaching the right leaders that really can make big impact decisions? So Car Carolina, this is a great question. I have actually soured a little bit on leadership. <laughs> As in, this is basically the ethos of Terra, which is don't wait for the leaders. <laughs> Let's build this from the ground up. Um, and we do see this in companies, especially because most of our fellows come from the private sector. We see enough employee pressure building up in companies where then the leadership feels, okay, you know, especially in Europe, it's become a retention strategy. So employers are beginning to realize that if they're not doing things around climate, um, then they are it's they they might lose employees. So I think I don't know if I am a little bit like maybe I don't know. I don't have a huge amount of faith in leadership. Uh, at least I don't want to sit around waiting for leadership. That's I'm just done with that. Uh, all of us can be can basically step up. Uh, we can apply to find a way to apply our skills. So. And I really do believe that's what it's going to shift this, what's going to make the shift. Uh, leadership would be awesome. And by the way, if you want to think about leadership in a different way, I really recommend the All We Can Save book because it provides an alternative model of leadership uh, because we need new forms of leadership. We shouldn't be doing things the old way. So yeah, a little bit cynical on leadership. Um, okay, question. I've heard that from a consumer perspective, the biggest impact people can make is how and where they spend their money. Do you agree this is the biggest leverage area to focus on with consumers? So 100%, yes. Like, yes. I mean, this sort of relates a bit to the question on behavioral change, but certainly people do, like how people decide to spend their money. Um, and with growing awareness, we might be able to shift the way they spend their money. Uh, you know, the question is like how far this can go. Uh, and so I don't have a clear answer. Certain things like say organic, so organic food has been in the US for a really, really long time. And yet it's never really like more than, I don't know, like 10%, under 10% of food consumption. So even with all of the attention on organic and awareness, it, it's still more expensive and people are not in large numbers going there. So remember though, as an individual, you uh, exercise power as a consumer. And if you live in a country, if you live in a country where the political system feels more responsive, you exercise power as a citizen. So you exercise power as a consumer, but you also exercise power as a citizen. So you can join advocacy groups. You can join things like your local Sierra Club, which is a very effective organization in the US for just engaging in local finding a way to participate in political action. You can join Sunrise Movement. There's lots of organizations in the US. This is not true, by the way, in many countries. In many countries, you don't feel that you have any power over the political system and you're better, you know, in that case, you're better off. So you exercise power as a citizen. You exercise power in your career's most valuable lever, okay? You exercise power in your jobs and where you choose to spend all this time, your working time, and on what you choose to spend that time, and you exercise power as consumers. Those are three different levels as an individual that you have power. Of course, also your money, how you invest your money, that's part of maybe consumer, but 
where you put your money. So those are all ways in which you can, yeah, have influence. Oh, Nigel is looking for four co-founders. Um, maybe if you join, a lot of people find their co-founders in our learning programs. Um, right now, the Learning Faction program is more focused. We we did, we've noticed that people are on five different, well, when people come into our Learning for Action program, they are on different paths. So one path is people just looking to shift jobs entirely. So they're like, I want to quit my job and I want a new job in climate. That's one path. The second path is I don't want to quit my job, but I want to upskill so I can have influence in my organization. That's another path where you actually try to shift your own organization. The third path is startups, nonprofit, for profit. You want to start up something new. That's another path. The fourth path is activism. So outside of your job, you want to do something, volunteer activism. And then there's a fifth path, which we've seen people come on. Actually, they are like going to go into graduate school and they're just trying to get like a grounding and figure out where they want to actually go much deeper. So that's like another path. Um, and people come into our programs and we actually have tracks for all these paths, but the one we're best served right now is like the upskilling and the jobs. And then the entrepreneurs, we have a few things going on. We did sort of run this little studio experiment for a while, but we're a small startup and we couldn't do it all. So we'll get back to that, but there's still a startup community um, on the app and inside our course community as well. Um, uh, not sure if you saw the viral video from Oxford about the balance of economics and green energy in the developing world, but how should we think about China, India, Africa, Asia versus the US in terms of incentives? Well, I sort of answered this a little bit earlier. Um, I guess the question is who is offering the incentives? One of the biggest problems has been around global climate finance and how much money is actually being allocated, how much money Northern countries are putting in. There's all these debates around how much should they put in, who's who's responsible, um, who should pay, who should pay for what. When the money gets to the other end, do you feel confident about how it's going to be used, how it's going to be deployed? Challenging. Um, you know, uh, we have a academic board member, Radhika Khosla. She's actually at Oxford, and and she says. She has this whole thing of like, what is net zero in the context of development? Like you need to think about net zero differently. And certainly in a country like India, any climate conversation is a non-starter if it's not also a development conversation. But the good news is it is a development conversation now because it's just good investment strategy. Like these are growing sectors and hey, people, you in developing country governments, especially like, don't you want a piece of this pie? There is so much money flowing into clean energy. This is a whole new economic opportunity. So instead of just thinking of it as costs and impacts, this is an area of economic opportunity. Uh, and that's one way to think about it, a different way to think about it, and a way to, of course, this is where all the justice question comes in, equity distribution, who's benefiting, who isn't, whether you trust your government to do the right thing there. But, I think it's a fake dichotomy, development versus environment. Maybe you could sort of say it applied when solar was so expensive, but I mean, honestly, you're really harming your own population if you're investing in fossil fuels at this point, like you're harming them in multiple ways. So um, there's just no like, this. it's not a dichotomy. I mean, they can both coexist. How much of the solution is technology? So it's technology, but never just technology, right? Like technology doesn't operate in a void. It operates in political realities. It operates in economic realities. Um, we have to change the politics. We have to change the policies. We have to, um, there's all these levers, finance, all these other things. So technology alone is never gonna, technology doesn't exist outside of these human systems that are going to develop and deploy them. Um, oh, so folks are asking some questions about what's happening in the Terra Bootcamp. We have three open houses. Uh, if you're in the app, you'll see announcements. If you've signed up anywhere on Terra, you'll get notices about this. We've got three of them coming up next three weeks. It's a, just focus on the bootcamp. Our fellows themselves will come and speak. People who've actually graduated will come and speak at them. You'll get to hear directly from people who've experienced them. 
come for one of the sorry not boot camps open houses yeah just come for the open houses and you'll learn a lot about the boot camps there um all right folks yeah please keep dropping off if you need to i guess i'm going to keep answering some questions um how much private sector impact is constrained or reliant on government policies and changes happening in the public sector so this is a very good question and i feel like the answer is changing by the day <laughs> um so one important thing about energy is that it is a regulated industry it's like a fun you know vital service and so you're not going to if you just focus on energy for a moment um and by the way ag is same food ag there's a lot of government employ you you will not escape you cannot escape government policy and you cannot escape public sector so what you want is that the public sector and the policies are supportive of the right types of private sector um growth and development so um for a long time by the way private sector was severely constrained so one thing i didn't mention is before i did that solar job i had this other job it was actually with the uk's first retail pv company i was a third employee our founder was jeremy legget he was ex scientific director of greenpeace and uh, we were starting a retail pv company in the uk solar century which then grew to be like an immense organization that just got bought out by the norwegian state energy company multi billion dollar industry now i think and uh, we were going to die without government support so basically there was nobody could buy straight retail pv in the uk in the late 90s we were trying to change that uh but we realized very quickly it's so expensive the panels are so expensive and we realized very quickly without government policy we were doomed we couldn't survive now the good thing was my boss was was a campaigner he had been with greenpeace for 10 years and before that by the way he was an oil prospector for shell so he went from literally like prospecting for oil in pakistan and afghanistan to joining greenpeace to starting the solar company and now he's starting a rewilding company in scotland um anyway he's a very interesting guy um and uh, we had to get policy so literally my boss would be down in the house of parliament like lobbying lobbying for policy and we got the first subsidy program for pv put in place and that was just critical and so for early days of solar it's been a this kind of and so there are a few countries that really committed germany was one that really drove solar in the early days because they put a they put a lot of government money into it a few countries like did a lot of policy support certain states in the us early on were doing some things at least so policy is a big enabler um, but now we're at a point where we need policy to be slightly different like you know invest figuring out ways in investing in transmission that kind of stuff so it's no longer like straight economics for solar as it is like kind of removing some of these other barriers which of course add to cost in some way or the other but in some ways it just stop like for example if you can't connect your solar farm to the grid you just can't operate um so yeah i think a lot of storytelling within corporate culture would help there are many stories telling on the economy that we do to yeah we need to shift this climate storytelling extremely important literally it's like how do you tell the right stories this is just a huge part of it where no matter what organization you're in it's like telling the right story that allows people to feel especially leadership has to feel like it's aligned with what their job is like it's aligned with their job um although we also need them to be courageous by the way and that can take a little bit of activism as well sometimes you got to push um and make them a little bit uncomfortable that's very hard by the way to do as an employee because you could lose your job so i'm not saying you should definitely do that but <clears throat> you need a little bit of carrot and you need a little bit of stick sometimes what are some ways to get local governments to take more effective steps in solving climate change um that's also a really good question i can't say i'm an expert on this um and it's just exceptionally context specific so but you'll be surprised what's going on around the world so the city of mumbai the government has come up with this big climate plan 
many an adaptation plan, but they've got a whole plan in place. Um, um, cities, okay, so cities, because they are ground zero for climate impacts, they can't help but pay attention to this. If you're going to have catastrophic flooding, it's going to play out in your city. If you're going to have hurricanes, it's going to like knock down your houses. If you're, you know, worse, like stronger or more frequent hurricanes. If you're going to have sea level rise and you're a coastal city, you are going to have to deal with this. Um, so I, um, cities can't help but pay attention to this. Um, plenty of cities have now like little climate like departments or offices or sustainability departments that are doing a bunch of stuff. They usually have policies and plans on their website. Um, the best way you can engage. So actually the other interesting thing is at least in the US, you do have quite direct access to local government. Like you can just find out like who represents your neighborhood and like, can you get involved? Um, like you can just call them up. Like in Hawaii, I could just call up like, you know, the city level counselor and like directly talk to somebody in her office. So you certainly have that level of access. And if you have certain skills you can offer, if you want to figure out how you can support their campaigns for like the more environmental ones, there's all ways in which you can get involved. Um, what are Terra and other orgs doing to inform hiring managers and recruiters that our skills are needed in our current state versus looking for science-based science -based backgrounds? Because this is a huge problem, blocker gap, both this exhausting and discouraging. Um, this is quite interesting. Um, so one thing is like, we do a fair amount of the science base, the science stuff in our, at least in our boot camp, And like, we've not seen people like struggling with those. Like you think you need more science than you do. Now, if you're gonna go for a very specialized job, like you are like, you know, like somehow figuring out how to interpret remote sense, sense data around forests, like, and then you need like deep ecological training, okay. You might need a master's or a PhD for that. But the most of the jobs that we are seeing literally don't need any climate skills. Like they are just like, we need a good software engineer. And hey, actually it would be nice if they knew a little thing about energy sometimes, but sometimes they don't even want that. They just want certain skills, basic skills that you have. Because say, if you're a big solar company, you're just hiring people who can do sales, who can do marketing, who can do you know, advocacy, lobbying, who can do engineering, who can do soft, you know, software and hardware, uh, who can manage people, manage installers, who work in HR, who can recruit. These are huge companies. So, but this is a really interesting point. Uh, and I work more on the learning side. We have all careers team. So I'm going to take this on board and see if we're seeing signs of this. We've got some data now we can look at and uh, look into this a little bit more. So thank you for making this point. NDCs that are not implemented successfully, what happens, who regulates these? I mean, this is a great question. This is where it comes back to like uh, domestic politics. And yeah, it's a great question. I mean, nobody is regulating this. Eventually there might be, I, I don't know, I can't see how any country is going to allow a bunch of other countries to dictate domestic policy, which is effectively what NDCs are. Um, I, you know, one of the things I've been seeing a lot of interesting stuff around right now is like forestry sector in India, like lots of questions around how baselines are getting set, what's getting counted as forests, how forests are entering these, calculations and numbers and accounts. Um, you know, it's a great question. Uh, by the way, even in the, so one important thing to know is that no country is on track for 1.5 C, not one. Even with the IRA, the US is not on track for 1.5 C. Even if we implemented it perfectly, we are not on track for 1.5 C. So first of all, NDCs are not even ambitious enough. Um, and then if we're not even implementing it, 
successfully yeah i don't have a clear answer there um uh okay as long as i'm working to support any one of these climate solutions doesn't matter which one i'm working on not really it doesn't yeah they're all important they're all really important so it doesn't matter which one you're working on yeah for emotional resilience what is your approach when i speak to friends who are disengaged because we are tired of being blamed and the price of anything green is just expensive given hyperinflation and booming economic crisis and yeah um so the okay so you often a good entry point into talking about climate with others is talking is starting with things that like you experience or see in your place where you live and that's so one important thing is like climate itself is abstract and people still think it's something in the future and they don't fully understand what's going on um definitely there's this problem of like feeling like we're both being blamed but we also like don't feel empowered so one issue one real issue is that it's kind of let's not make it abstract let's enter these conversations concretely um like say if your city has suffered from flooding or some kind of weather phenomena or at least even in your country you're seeing like heat waves or whatever enter the conversation through something that you can like feel really relatable um but the other very important side of it is it is now an opportunity space for professional work so it is an opportunity space for professional work and that might be an interesting point for conversation which is like hey actually this is my skills i don't really know how they apply start doing some having some conversations do some research join the terra community like start thinking of it as a place where you could work um and that can feel like a more positive conversation and it makes it just very concrete and context specific because then you have to think about okay what opportunities do i have what kinds of jobs are out there um those kinds of questions as opposed to just focusing on the negative side of the problem which is very hard and disempowering and scary and can lead to disengagement um thank you for your notes sarika and nigel um there's so many questions i am so sorry but i have to pause i would like to stay all day but i have other things i have to do um i really appreciate all your questions and your time but i am going to wrap this session so you can also attend other sessions during this careers week um again do come to our open houses they are happening um feb 7th feb let me just call them out again uh feb 7th feb 14th feb 21st at 8 am pt is in our app you can just join uh and there's a 20% discount for joining our courses uh climate week 20 you can just use the code when you apply and um we also have another whole talk just focused on careers and skills that's coming up by my colleague Seth Collins uh, just do look it up and attend that that should be complimentary to this one so thank you all again and yeah i look forward to seeing you in other parts of the terra ecosystem bye bye